Okay, live. Welcome everybody to the fourth webinar of the Standing Committee for Gender Equality in Science. The SCGES is an independent committee funded in 2020 by nine international scientific organizations. This webinar is organized by the International Union of Biological Sciences, IUBS, with the great help of Nathalie Pompoy, the executive director of IUBS. Michel Garfinkel and I are the moderators today. Michel is head of the policy program at EMBO, meaning European Molecular Biological Organization. I had to, to, to find it on the internet to see what it meant, the acronym. Her major areas of policy research are biotechnology, responsible conduct of research and open science. Previously, she was a policy analyst at the G. Craig Venter Institute, a research fellow at the Center for Science, Policy and Outcomes of Columbia University, and still earlier, a research associate at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and she is an elected fellow of the AAAS. Myself, I'm Annelies Piero Bult. I'm, I'm a former treasurer of IUBS. I worked on taxonomy and biogeography, I still work on it, of oceanic zooplankton, especially the, the phylum of ketognaths in the University of Amsterdam and, and the, and the um, ooh, I did something with my computer, and the Museum Naturalis in Leiden in the Netherlands. I was president of the International Association of Biological Oceanography and board member of SCORE, Scientific Committee on Oceanic Research. I still am the treasurer of SCOPE, the Scientific Committee on Problems of the Environment. I have been president of the Women's Committee of the University of Amsterdam. I have been for seven years the treasurer of the European Women's Lobby in Brussels, and I'm still treasurer of the University Women of Europe. We will now see a short video of Catherine Jamais, who played a driving role in the foundation of the Standing Committee for Gender Equality in Science and in 2020, and is currently its chair. She is a senior researcher at the French CN. She's trained in mathematics and st Chinese studies. She's an historian of science and Secretary General of the International Union of History and Philosophy of Science and Technology. Her field of research is the circulation of scientific and technical knowledge between China and Europe in the 17th and 18th century. She also has an interest in the history of women in science, fortunately. She's the editor of the journal East Asian Science, Technology and Medicine and she's the Secretary General of the International Union of History and Philosophy of Science and Technology. The word is to, Kat to Katrin. Welcome to the fourth SCGES webinar. My name is Katrin Jamy. I am a researcher at the French CNRS, and I am the chair of the Standing Committee for Gender Equality in Science, acronym SCGES. SCGES is an independent committee formed in 2020 by nine international scientific organizations, most of which are full members of the International Science Council, ISC. These founding partners had worked together on the ISC-supported project, a global approach to the gender gap in mathematical computing and natural sciences, how to measure it, how to reduce it, this project became known as the Gender Gap in Science Project. Today, SCGES has 19 partners, most of which are ICS, ISC, sorry, International Union members. They represent millions of scientists brought together across disciplines to promote gender equality in science. The aim of SCGES is to ensure liaison amongst international scientific unions to foster gender equality and the implementation of the recommendations of the Gender Gap in Science project. GES actively cooperates with policymakers and international organizations, first and foremost, ISC for the promotion of gender equality in science. 
In our work, we strive to take into account the diversity of the situation of women around the world and across disciplines and to explore good practices. For our fourth webinar, the International Union of Biological Sciences, one of our founding partners, is exploring the issue of quotas for women in science, asking whether they are an effective step toward gender equality. Thank you, Catherine, for this explanation of our work. Before giving the floor to the speakers, here are some information on the audience. As of Monday, when the statistics were complied. Please, first slide. So here you see where the registered participants came from. And NS means not specified. So you see we have a large audience in the in the in the eastern part here and Europe and then some of the other countries for this seminar, which is for some people really a difficult time. Next one, please. So we have mainly female, as, as was expected, and then male and non 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 answered questions and diverse. Next one, please. So these are the disciplines. And you see there's quite a bit of uh, mathematics and biology and, and then physics letter and no indication and then sociology. Okay. Also a very audience and interest in sociology. And, um, and, and on the lesser, the lesser. But you see it's quite a, a big uh, uh, diversity of subjects and interests. Next one, please. So about four of fifth gave an answer, 80%, which is really good. It's a very diverse state of career, undergraduates, PhD students, postdocs, assistant professors, associate professors and full professors, and emeritus professors. So the interest for the gender equality topic at all possible states of career and throughout the world, which is very good for us and that the interest may persist because we need that if we want to go on and and reach a state of um, of more equality we don't want to wait for 50 or more years i think this was the last one huh so then we go on to the next speaker oh no i have some i have some housekeeping instructions sorry we can't do uh, everything on online and and on audio so when you have questions please type it in the in the chat box put a queue in front of the of, of your when it's a question and put a c when it's just a comment so we would like to have the um, because we can then sort out the questions more easily so questions from the audience will be taken at the end of the presentations of each presentation and from the audience will also be taken during our discussion part so when you have uh, la later on a question on the presentation, you can do it in the discussion part. So a Q in front of your question and a C for a comment. And then I would like to go on to introduce Marguerite evans Galea, Maggie for short. She's a member of the Order of Australia and MAICD means a member of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. She is a director she works on STEM career strategy with the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering. She's a co-founder and a co-chair of Women in STEM Australia. She has led international research programs in cell and gene ther therapy for genetic disease at world leading organizations in the United States and Australia. An international recognized, she's an international recognized advocate for it for inclusion and diversity. And Dr. Evans Kalea served as on the SAGE Expert Advisory Group with the National Academies and the Inaugural Minister Council for Women's Equality in Victoria. Please, the floor is for Maggie.
traditional owners of the land today. Thanks for the thousands. We advocate and provide policy recommendations to government, and we also connect women in STEM across sectors. I'm also a woman in the STEM sector. My academic career of 18 years has been immensely rewarding, but it's also been peppered with the challenges that many, many women face. As a values-led change maker and an but also inclusive and safe. As a sector, we know the issues faced by women in research fall broadly into four areas, career disruptions, metrics, the hyper-competitive nature of our funding systems, as well as the culture. How we define success really can make a huge difference as to what a scientist or a woman. Often it means that women face and therefore end up on a slower track. Good quotas accelerate the career trajectory of women. Good quotas foster an inclusive environment and culture. Good quotas shift how we respond to career disruptions, how we define success, and what kind of culture we're going to build. Funding models. That's a really critical one. legislation. A review of the amendments of the French Law House between 2002 and 2017 have found that during one term of office, a female MP is 75% more likely than a male MP. Family. Certainly, there was a woman in any given term. Clearly, this diversifies the thinking in the room. In Egypt, the parliament has quotas not only for women, but also for people with disability and Indigenous Egyptian people. In the House of Representatives, Egypt has 28% of seats held by women, which exceeds the current quota. There's still more to be done there, yes, no doubt, but at least there's a formal baseline. In Australia, the Honour a Woman campaign calls for gender quotas in the Australian honour system at every level. Women have received fewer awards overall and cluster at the lower levels of those awards. This year though, at the highest level of AC, the companion of the order, five of eight awards went to women and wonderfully, four of those five were women in STEM. The political Australian Labor Party introduced the Affirmative Action Rule in 1994, operating under a voluntary gender quota for more than 20 years in the state and federal levels. While this has had varying degrees of success, the ALP is our newly elected government and already Australia can see that parliament is not only more gender balanced, but it's also more diverse and inclusive of people with disabilities, people of colour and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. The Labor-led government in Victoria's state government was the first to introduce legislation on gender equality. I was very proud to have a small contribution and role in this process. 
The Gender Equality Act commenced in March 2021 and will improve workplace gender equality within the Victorian public sector, universities and local councils. The Act promotes gender equality by requiring the Victorian public sector, local councils and universities to take positive action towards achieving workplace gender equality. It requires reporting new programs and encourages them to put things out there publicly. Victoria also established the Public Sector Gender Equality Commissioner to provide advice, education, support implementation and also enforce compliance, a really key factor. Women MPs I've served with have openly stated that there is a notable culture shift within Victoria's government since the introduction of these targets and quotas and that there's much broader discussion in parliament and that gender has disappeared from the room. Fantastic. In Australia's research sector, we have a lack of women and people from diverse backgrounds in leadership. The reasons argued are always the same. We appoint on merit. The women who do not apply are not as experienced as the men. There are not enough women who apply. We couldn't find any women. So generally there are two arguments, merit and the number of women. The concept of merit is gendered. Think about it. If you have nine men and one woman in a room defining merit and what success looks like, of course, it's going to be male dominated thinking and experiences that come up with that definition. It's male dominated thinking that can define KPIs and metrics as well. However, if you have nine women and one man in the room, it's no different. Again, it will be gendered. That's why gender balance and diversity in the room really makes a difference. Women make up more than 50% of Australia's population. But more importantly, women make up 50% of our STEM graduates as well across many disciplines, not all, but many. 58% of PhD graduates in biomedical research are women. And this field has had that kind of graduation rate for decades. However, still there are few women in leadership around the 17 to 20% mark. In truth, there are plenty of women. This is not a pipeline issue. It's about boosting them into leadership which we work, live and study has been molded by men for generations. In Western countries, this is almost always white Caucasian men who have significant privilege compared to women and to people from underrepresented groups in Australia. To remove gender bias when defining success in science, we must include diverse and equal voices in the room. Importantly, we must go beyond gender and be inclusive of a diverse range of individuals from different backgrounds, experiences and identities. Quotas could help us to do this and fast. The Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering has set clear gender targets of 40, 40, 20% anyone. This is very inclusive of non-binary individuals as well. For the selection of new fellows and awards, this is the rule. But beyond this, into our programs, events and more, we aim to apply this type of target. The goal is to urge us all to consider gender and diversity during selection processes, development of policies and practices and programs, and by tracking and reporting on gender and diversity targets, ultimately do better. In accordance with the diversity and inclusion policy, gender and increasingly diverse identity groups are measured over time and also embedded within ATSI's strategy. In the last three years, ATSI has tracked gender and diversity in a much more detailed way, and it will continue to increase these parameters over time in collaboration with the fellowship. Women in Australia's STEM sector cluster towards the early career stage. We all know that. They submit fewer grant applications and often experience lower success rates relative. Like the national health agency measures to ensure that women researchers will receive a percentage of the funding. 
And even after this, there's still less funding compared to men. While these additional support measures are important and welcome, introducing quotas for the distribution of research funding would ensure that women-led research is supported and sustainable, and that more women are retained in research careers and ultimately elevated in what an opportunity. It's not only women in research asking for this kind of action, it's the next generation as well. In Plan International's 2021 We Can Lead report, two key re recommendations from Australia's young women leaders are, implement policy to ensure that parliament and all workplaces, schools and higher education institutions are safe and equal spaces for all women and one that's free from misogyny and sexual harassment. Political parties, this is the second one, Political parties must act urgently to enforce stricter quotas, not just for women, but for all people of different sexualities, genders, ethnicity, and backgrounds who represent the diversity of the country in which we live. Australia's future leaders are calling for action. They're calling for quotas and for cultural change. And this includes our future leaders within STEM, research, and industry. We must listen, we must commit, and we must become staunch allies. More importantly, we must take action. Ultimately though, quotas will not be enough by themselves. For quotas to have long-term benefit, they will need to be complemented by a suite of targeted programs and initiatives that drive systemic change, foster safe and inclusive environments, support women's professional development, and in the end, actively boost them into leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marguerite, for your inspiring talk. And I hope that you will have great success in trying to get the barriers down. For now, we are nicely in time. And so I give the floor to Michelle to introduce Renee for um, her introduction and her talk. Great. Thank you, Annelies, and, um, and nice to meet everyone, even um, if at a distance and through, uh, through a screen. And I'm happy to be able to um, moderate the next three talks coming up, which we will be running here live. Um, for, uh, for Maggie's talk, of course, she is not with us here to be able to answer direct questions, but we will pick up points from her talk during the general discussion. Um, right now, we will have three short talks, about 12 to 13 minutes each. This will leave about four or five minutes for direct questions to each of the speakers. So if you have questions come up on the talk, as, um, as you are listening, please put them in the chat and we will handle them in the direct question session. Um, following uh, the three talks, we will have about a half hour general discussion and can pick up those as well. So our first talk in the session will be from Renee Borges. She is a professor at the Center for Ecological Sciences at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. She's a behavioral ecologist with an interest in interspecies interactions and particularly those that involve mutualism and parasitism. She is an elected fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, and she is also there the current secretary. She is also a fellow in the Indian National Science Academy and a J.C. Bose National Fellow. Um, she's uh, done work in, um, in scientific publishing as well as the editor-in-chief of the journal Biosciences, and she's on the editorial board of Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. Um, and she's served actually interestingly on the Council of International Society for Chemical Ecology, a, a particularly um, a rich area, and finally at the Association for Tropical Biology and Conservation. So you will see that she's coming at these issues from several different perspectives and not particularly mentioned here, but which we know um, in a role as a grant maker and funder. So she will have um, lots of intersecting um, uh, thinking on these issues. So, Rene, I turn to you. Uh, thank you so much, Michelle, for that very kind 
uh, introduction and I'm really happy to be part of uh, this process and discussion today. So I'm coming to you, as M Michelle said, uh, wearing different hats today and I hope that I will be able to share with you some of the experiences that we have had in India. Um, so if we take, uh, you know, look at women in education, for example, how many people or women have been enrolled and we look through the decades, we do see a significant, uh, particularly in university enrollment, uh, a rise in percentage, but this is clearly still not enough. You know, we are just at about uh, forty percent, which really requires much more investment. Um, if we look at and um, try and break up uh, this education uh, into different sectors, uh, whether it be science, engineering, medicine, agriculture, <clears throat> even veterinary science, and so on, we do see certainly. Uh, a kind of exponential rise in uh, enrollment in university education. So that's uh, interesting, but uh, we still have, you know, quite a long way to go. Uh, as has been mentioned by earlier speakers, uh, there is a dropout. So we have women in undergraduate uh, education, they're doing their master's degree, their PhDs, but then as they get into postdocs or professorial positions or, you know, whether they become science leaders, you can see a very, very steady and steep decline in the proportion of, of women, you know, uh, that are within uh, this end of, uh, of the so-called curve. Uh, in India, we have a science, technology and innovation policy, STIP 2020, and this has drawn inspiration from uh, some interventions. Scientific Social Responsibility Policy, uh, SSR 2020. And we have the recent National Education Policy 2020, uh, which aims to bring in, uh, you know, some new ideas and some new modifications. Uh, the STIP policy does aim to address discrimination and inequalities based on gender, caste, religion, disability, geography, as well as language. India, as you know, is really not a country, it's a subcontinent. And we have vast differences in language, in culture, and uh, different parts of India suffer from different constraints. So uh, we hope that uh, this tip policy uh, will improve, uh, you know, the overall perceptions and progress of women towards higher achievements. Uh, I'm not going to read all of this, uh, but this is essentially taken from the STIP 2020 policy. And I just want to flag uh, something about uh, how we are trying to achieve at least 30% of women in decision-making bodies including selection and evaluation committees and how this will be mandated. So this is almost like a quota in that sense. And also to draw your attention to the particular uh, focus on the uh, LGBTQ community, which also has a prominent mention in this uh, STIP 2020, including differently abled individuals. Um, STIP uh, 2020, to go on with that, as I said, provisions will be made for sensitization, orientation, counseling, 
with regard to gender, sexuality, ethnicity, language, etc. So this appears to be a policy that has been carefully thought out, but uh, we need to see in a coming decade uh, whether the implementation of this policy is how successful uh, this is going to be. Um, the government of India has had some enabling uh, schemes which have certainly helped uh, women in science, particularly women who might have had to take a career break. So, for example, the women in science uh, scheme or where women who've had a career break, they do get research and a travel grant and a fellowship for three years. And this will enable, you know, women who have had a career break to be able to come back into the mainstream. Uh, there are other schemes uh, for retooling, retraining, as well as for entrepreneurship. And this scheme has actually been in practice for uh, over 20 years. Uh, I'm sorry, this is a bit tiny for you to see, but doesn't matter. What this is saying is that these are the number of grants that have been awarded uh, over the years to various uh, uh, science professionals. And these are the numbers of grants that women have been able to uh, secure. And you can see that, you know, this has also been steadily climbing, though certainly not climbing as fast as the overall granting situation. Um, now to come from uh, and the Indian Academy of Science perspective, because I'm the secretary of the Indian Academy of Sciences, you can see the same problem. Uh, the orange is the number of female fellows that were elected and the blue is the number of women fellows. And you can see that over the years when the academy began way back in 1934, uh, women were barely a blip on the landscape, but slowly have try to, you know, get greater representation in the fellowship. Um, uh, this again tells you uh, the year wise election of fellows and you can see there were some years in the recent past where you had as many as 11 women fellows elected. And then, of course, it, uh, there have been great drops. And we hope that, you know, we are now actively in the academy promoting, um, you know, this uh, uh, inclusion of nomination and inclusion of many, many more women. Uh, if we want to break up this into the different science disciplines, again, you see, uh, for example, the orange is men and the blue is women and you can see that some streams let's say like medicine or general biology uh, you get more women becoming fellows but there are other streams let's say like chemistry or earth and planetary sciences where there are very few women of course this could also in chemistry there are a lot of women uh, but very few women get elected. In earth and planetary sciences, there are fewer women in the profession and uh, the proportion that get elected may reflect their representation in that particular discipline. Unfortunately, in this slide, I don't have that proportionate, you know, how many women there actually are in this uh, sector. Uh, it would be interesting to actually examine that. Um, in the academy, we also have young associates. They are not fellows, but they're called associates. And these are early career researchers. And there too, you can see, though it's not so starkly uh, skewed in the sense of across disciplines. And this is actually because we do have a quota here. We try to make sure that um, we do get, you know, equal, um, well, not equal numbers of women, but at least a, as good a representation of women as is possible. Um, this also tells you in terms of the number of nominations. So the process is, of course, women get nominated or men get nominated, and then they may or may not make it into the fellowship. 
and you you can see that in the nominations part also you get many fewer women being nominated compared to men uh, I think we can skip this. Uh, okay, so now to come to another role that I have, and I belong to the Indian Institute of Science, which is uh, has been ranked as perhaps the best institution for research and education in the country. And this is an image taken from the Department of Physics in 1978, uh, not terribly long ago. And I don't think I need to explain this image because you can see or maybe be hard for you to find the number of women in this image. Uh, unfortunately, this hasn't changed a lot. You will have maybe a few more women, but certainly not an equal number of representatives. So there are departments even in our elite institutions that have a lot to answer for and have really to actively recruit women into these uh, institutions of you know, great eminence in our country. Um, I just need to talk a little bit about uh, something that I think we really need to uh, you know, pay very hard attention to and uh, it is this business of our biological clocks as women and the academic clock. And we know that the biological clock and the academic clock pretty much march in tandem. But in effect, they need to be decoupled. Uh, I'm sure all of us are aware of the uh, higher risks of uh, chromosome abnormalities leading to you know, uh, possibilities of children being born with disabilities. Uh, there's also uh, something which maybe a lot of people may not be aware of, and these are recent data coming, uh, saying postponement of pregnancy. So if you decide to have your children later, assuming that you can deal with the risks of, you know, other chromosomal abnormalities, you actually increase your risk for breast cancer. So it's like you are between these terrible, you know, the Scylla and Charybdis, uh, you're really between the devil and the deep blue sea almost. And I think therefore that we really need to, uh, as some of the strong recommendations coming from women in India, is to consider academic age while hiring and not biological age. And by academic age is really, you know, where in your career are you at this point? It doesn't matter whether you're a little older. Um, and actually, this should be not just for hiring, but for all career advancement schemes. So this has been recommended, as I said, in the current STIP policy that I was quoting from. And uh, some institutions uh, are enlightened enough to try and break out of this uh, decoupling the biological clock and the academic clock. Uh, we need to improve, of course, the work climate, which has already been mentioned, and this has been uh, receiving attention. We also have this gender advancement for transforming institutions. This is called the Gati Ch Charter. I'm not going to quote from it. And for those of you who might be interested, this is the so-called uh, Indian version of the Athena Swan Charter. Uh, somebody might talk about this, I don't know. Uh, so uh, the academies have also tried to bring this thing to the fore. We've got several publications. I'm wrapping up my talk now very rapidly. Uh, we have publications uh, highlighting the efforts of uh, women in India uh, and have sort of modified this into a book for younger uh, girls. Uh, sort of like an inspirational set of uh, biographies. I just want to end with this one fun story. Uh, in India, for those of you who might watch Indian television, I don't know. Uh, this is a very famous Indian actor, uh, Amitabh Bachchan. 
and he's now telehost of an important TV show uh, translated as, you know, who wants to be a millionaire or who will become a millionaire? And this was a question that was asked in this television show about this book, Leela Vati's Daughters, that I just told you. And, uh, you know, the uh, options were Leela Vati's Daughter, a book published by the Indian Academy of Sciences, features 100 essays on which of these groups of people? women scientists, architects, historians, or poets. And it was uh, this uh, lovely young woman who was a teacher from Chhattisgarh, she won 50 lakh of rupees for correctly answering this question. So, you know, knowing about women in science can be monetarily also very useful. I I'll end here and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Rene. And um, I, I have um, several questions and comments I would love to throw out. And uh, um, as well, um, we have a little bit coming in. So um, let me actually start with just um, the question about, so you have within the academy this partial quota system. What is the feedback you've gotten on that both from members and from outside, because as we know, you know, researchers have sort of very strong senses of ownership over their academies. Um, do you have a, a little information from us about reactions? Uh, I think the reaction has been quite positive that uh, we do realize that there have been a lot of very excellent women who have sort of been um, you know, overlooked over the years. And uh, so I think that uh, certainly the reactions have been positive. I do not know of any reaction that was negative that said, you know, X person should not have been elected. And uh, no, I, I, I cannot say that that has happened. But of course, there is always controversies about election to any academy, as you well know. So whether it is a man or a woman, they will always be the naysayers and the promoters. So I guess, you know. Yeah, it's a little hard to separate those out and sure. sort of that, that sure. baseline controversy. And you had mentioned as well sort of the one concept, and I think Ellen will talk about this a little as well, as to having sort of more of a regulatory approach as well. Is it in those approaches that you're familiar with? So sort of regulation implies that if um, the action is not followed, there's some kind of penalty for that. Has there been any discussion around that? Or is it more about regulatory as in you know, stating it more strongly? I don't think there is any penalty per se, but uh, these, uh, you know, making something mandatory. So if it becomes mandatory, then it, there may be an implied penalty. But I think uh, people have become sufficiently sensitized, at least in, in many institutions. Uh, and women are also sort of demanding, you know, their, uh, their rights. And I, I, I see that as a positive. But of course, you must remember that India is a vast country with very, very different cultures and uh, exposure and access also. So what might apply in some of the, uh, you know, more connected parts of the country may be very different. And we are quite uh, sensitive to this. For example, uh, the northeastern portion of India has really been terribly neglected for decades in terms of both education. It's very remote. It hasn't had sufficient connectivity for various reasons. And so we are very conscious of this and we are trying hard, uh, both in terms of research programs, uh, which affect men and women. So there, you know, there is this problem of overall access to education and high quality education. But even there, we would need to, you know, uh, uh, make sure that the women are 
uh, sufficient. Though, of course, it's, it's, it's also interesting that in India, we also have uh, places where there are, is a matriarchal society. So in the northeast of India, uh, we have a lot of matriarchal societies, as we have in uh, some parts of South India. So where you have a matriarchal, uh, you know, a control over over things because it's it's a social system that is matriarchal as opposed to patriarchal societies in the rest of the country uh, that interface between uh, uh, the social you know um, system and uh, education and opportunities must also be looked at and maybe can work to one's advantage yeah Fantastic. Great. And we can definitely pick that up in the discussion where we'll also pick up. I have a comment here from uh, Nandita Jaraj um, regarding India's sort of more general history with quotas and exactly what the risks and benefits are. And we will pick that up in the longer discussion. Sure. And then um, if I can just get a very quick answer, um, did you get the women's biographies into Wikipedia? Uh, I'm not sure about that. I can't answer it, but I know that it's a PDF is freely available for to be downloaded. Oh, uh, if you go to the yeah, so actually many many uh, schools and colleges and universities and some of these matriarchal places that I was telling you about, uh, they have actually made it required reading, and I have had um, interesting questions if I have traveled to those colleges or universities because they they recognize um, maybe me because they've read me in about me in the book and uh, so I think uh, it has made a, a little difference. Fantastic great thank you so much Super interesting, and again, looking forward to picking this up. So we will move on now. Our next speaker is Gerilyn Wallen, and it is a particular pleasure for me to welcome her as we are very close colleagues at, at EMBO. Um, the, as Annelise pointed out, we actually don't spell out our acronym anymore, and then it forces people to go look it up, so I do apologize for that. Um, but uh, in more seriousness, so Gerilyn is the head of the EMBO Young Investigator Network, the EMBO courses and workshops and co-head of EMBO Global Activities and perhaps um, most relevant here is responsible for women in science activities where we work very closely together and, and she will actually talk about some of our work which um, I'm very much looking forward to um, hearing feedback on that. Um, so she actually had previously also developed the EMBO laboratory management courses for leadership development and had co-authored several studies on the selection processes and the effects of gender and application success at EMBO. And you know, these are really interesting intersections, how we learn to manage, how we learn to lead, and then what success ends up coming from that. Um, uh, as well, we have the um, from Gerilyn, the uh, report on quotas in academia, and as well um, has done work on uh, virtual and hybrid meetings, so very relevant here today, where again, there is a um, EDI component to that as well, which I think may be relevant during the longer discussion later. Um, Gerilyn has her PhD in biochemistry from Brandeis University, which is in Waltham, Massachusetts in the US, and did her postdoc at the EMBL in Heidelberg. So with that, Gerilyn, floor is yours. You are muted. Can you hear me? And, but you can't see my talk anymore, right? Right, we can hear you, but we do not see your talk. Okay, sorry, I have to start again. Apologies for this. Um, somehow, I'm not going to find it. Can you see my talk, my uh, screen now? 
we see your screen. We're seeing just the uh, file. We're not seeing the presentation. Oh, hmm. it's open for me. It says uh, we are, I'm sharing the screen with somebody else. So, Rene, have you stopped sharing? So maybe we're still competing. I think I've stopped sharing. Uh, okay. Yeah, on here it looks like Renee's not sharing. Uh, just click on the plus sign and then uh, hold that plus sign. Then you will get all the documents and then click on your document. Yeah. There you go. Yep. Now, okay. Yep, now it's up. Yep. Really? Because I cannot see it now. It's not my PDF presentation. So I really do not know where I am and how to move it forward. So honestly, I'm not sure. We can see we can see your exploring yeah. quarters in academia and full screen. So, okay, so you can see that and, and you can see my next screen now. So I see yes. now. Okay, okay, I'll start. Okay, so thank you very much and sorry for this confusion. Worked better when we tested it. So um, uh, thank you for the uh, introduction, Michelle. And of course, Michelle could also be giving this talk just as well as I can because we worked on this uh, study together, together with our uh, uh, colleague Sandra Bendisholi. So it was really a, a, a work that we did all together. Um, so the study is called Exploring Quotas in Academia, and uh, let me give you a bit of background. Um, so, first of all, uh, why we have worked on this is because there are few women in the top echelons of an academic career, and we are in particular looking, of course, at STEM. And, and then, of course, the question that arises from this is what can be done about that? And in the study, we particularly addressed uh, quota as a means to, um, to uh, improve matters. So, let me give you just a few facts. So this is uh, adapted from the she figures. I'm taking the data from 2018. Sorry, I haven't updated that yet. But what you're seeing here on the x-axis is uh, the different steps of an academic career. And on the y-axis, the percentage of men and women at these different steps. So if you then look at uh, um, at undergraduate level up to PhD student, women are quite well represented. But then the percentage of women goes selectively down. We can also see that it does rise about 0.5% per year. This is over all uh, um, disciplines in Europe, uh, just as an uh, explanation. And if you were to extrapolate from that data, you'd come to the conclusion that in about 50 to 60 years, there would be equality if that happens. Um, so is this really you know if if we can do a linear uh, linear extrapolation so the question is really when can we expect equal representation at the highest level so this was a um, a question what that was explored uh, by a group from uh, around robin marshke from colorado state university so they actually looked at how the demographic development of their uh, faculty would develop under, under different circumstances. So first of all, when they checked the scientific li literature, they found out that change in occupational segregation is moving at a glacial speed. So in former times, yes, this used to mean very slow. So um, in order to calculate uh, and, and uh, extrapolate, you'd have to um, consider a number of demographic constraints. First of all, faculty age structure. So once you hire somebody, they will be with you for the next 30 years at least. Um, then, of course, gender composition among PhD earners. Clearly, you cannot hire who's not qualified. So in their case, over Colorado State University, all faculties was 40% female PhD earners. Then, of course, you have to take into account faculty attrition and retention. And here again, uh, it was noted that women faculty, even after tenure, tenure leave uh, Colorado State at a higher rate than men. And then, of course, you might have to take into account new faculty positions. So 
when they did the extrapolation, they went for 100 years, remember the glacial speed. So they started at 20% uh, female faculty throughout uh, their, their departments, and they calculated with the hiring of 40%, you know, they had 40% they female PhD students. And then um, they did the extrapolation, and they came to the conclusion after some 30 odd years, you'd get to 34% female faculty at steady state if you continue like this. Um, only 34 because um, what I told you before is that females leave Colorado State at a uh, faster rate. So if they then manipulated the numbers, and obviously um, you can get to 40% if you think of equal exits and do something there. Anyway, so again, it takes you some 30 odd years to get to 40%. So now they thought, how can we actually improve and increase the, the, the percentage of women? And they said, well, why don't we put in a quota of 50%, right? It's a fair, fair hiring quota, it seems. And then you can come to the conclusion that it actually takes um, 30 to 40 years to, uh, to get to 50% women. So it is quite a slow process. And then they thought, well, what, what happens if we actually hire only women from now on? And then actually uh, you are at uh, parity after 11 years. So that would be quite an efficient measure, right? So, so this is what we're looking at in terms of uh, time, time frame. So the question is, are quotas the solution to this? And um, So the problem that academia has with quotas is that they, uh, people, are, um, academicians, are worried that um, uh, everything okay. Okay, uh, people in academia are worried that um, if there are uh, quota, that people who are not meritorious might get uh, selected and hence affect the quality of uh, the the scientific uh, community. Oh. Um, here is a study that um, shows that, uh, in fact, the judgment of merit is very much uh, influenced by the gender dimension. So this is from Marike van der and Yvonne Benshop, who looked at hiring at uh, universities in the Netherlands and found that uh, a lot of other things than uh, scientific merit, and how do you judge that in any case, is being taken into account in hiring. Um, where is this? Next one. So actually, where have quotas been tried? So quotas have actually been tried in political representation, and we've heard a bit about that before as well. Um, so there are quota in uh, for different uh, either parties themselves or in parliaments, um, and and have been quite effective in increasing the percentage of women. Uh, unfortunately, the United States and the United Kingdom are very low. They do not have any quotas, and they are almost on par with the United Arab Emirates, which is not known for gender equality either. Um, another uh, part where quotas have been tried is in business, and I think the most well-known in that respect is the 40%, uh, uh, you know, the famous 40% quota of women on boards from uh, Norway, and which has been copied in some other countries to a similar level. So, um, do quotas, in fact, do diminish quality? Well, there is data that shows that they don't. So, uh, paper that I find really convincing is this, uh, the crisis of the mediocre man. So, in this study, uh, this is from Sweden, and in this study, uh, the um, uh, authors look at the level of education and qualification that members in parliament, uh, city councils, etc., have after, um, you know, before and after uh, the 50% the quota. And they found that actually the level of education is higher in the new parliaments that are 50 50 than in what you had before. So this actually means that uh, the mediocre men are actually being taken out and you know, you'd have a higher qualified representation. And I'm not going to get into this affirmative action thing. I, it's a complicated experiment, which I can explain if you guys, if you want uh, later. So, um, 
Now let's get to our report. Um, I told you, so we did this together with also with the Robert with we'll funding from the Robert Bosch uh, Foundation, and we analyzed quota in three areas. So firstly, quota for hiring at the highest career level, then quotas for the comp composition of evaluation committees, and then require and then requiring equal success rate for research funding. So I'll summarize quickly what we did. So for the quotas for hiring, we actually looked at something that is called the cascade model. The first time I'd heard about it was from the Karolinska Institute in, in, in Sweden, in Stockholm. And th it means that you would set the quota for, on the basis of the uh, percentage of women, the level below. You know, just as an example, if you wanted to have a quota for full professors, you take the percentage of women on the asso associate professor level uh, of the associate professor level and below that is assistant professor level and below that and this is where it becomes interesting now is um, the the um, postdoctoral level at least in the stem is the postdoctoral level and that's where it becomes complicated because you have you would have to calculate you know how would you calculate that number and that's uh, um, because and that is actually quite interesting the number of postdocs are i don't think they're known anywhere really because the term postdoc is not uh, is not uh, um, determined uh, clearly Anyway, so the cascade model or quotas in hiring would affect long-term changes in academic units. It's realistic and based on the composition of individual departments in the, in the institutional workforce, and it requires the active participation of the institute. So where does this actually, where is this actually implemented? And indeed, um, the German Science Foundation has recommended it to all universities in, 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 in Germany. But actually, it's been become law in North Rhine-Westphalia. It's one of our states um, uh, since 2014. And I've just actually looked to see, we've been in contact with the, one of the universities there to find out how it works. And really, the main problem there is to determine the proper uh, uh, levels for, for, for the entry uh, numbers. And um, Yes, uh, I do not know, and, and that would be interesting to see how they actually have now uh, put this into in, in, into practice. So no 100% results there yet, despite this having been uh, implemented in 2014. Um, the other quota that we've looked at is for the comp composition of selection com co uh, committees. Uh, it is first, of course, to reduce isolation and tokenism to be the only woman or the only man on a committee full of uh, uh, members of the other sex is quite uh, daunting and makes you really feel isolated. And it also broadens the points of view and discussions, as many uh, uh, discussed earlier. The question is, what is the right uh, percentage? When does it start? when do individuals feel not being the token uh, member of the committee and there is uh, nothing really in set in stone but the percentage of uh, percentage of 30 is frequently quoted um, and then uh, the next thing that we've been looking at is re uh, e require equal success rate this means that um, even if the percentage of male and female applicants is not equal, um, at least their success rates should be equal. So uh, if you have 70% male applicants and 30% female applicants in the uh, uh, awardees, this, this percentage should also be uh, reflected. So this means, you know, if you uh, require this, systemic bank biases could be included, the applicant pool would be fairly reflected, um, and also equal success rate might encourage a higher rate of applications by the underrepresented group. So we have seen uh, that quotas can make change happen fast. Uh, well, uh, the uh, 50 years were not exactly, or 40 years were not exactly fast, but faster than what we're seeing right now, just so to, to be realistic. But quota are not addressing stigma. So first of all, um, uh, many women are against quota because they feel stigmatized. They do not want to be the token quota woman who, um, who just got there because there was a quota and not because she's particularly qualified. Um, the academic community generally is often not convinced 
convinced they are actually convinced that their way of judging merit is the best way to uh, look and, and do advancement. And of course, they do not, quote, do not address all issues affecting gender balance. And that means, uh, for example, they do not address that precipitous, precipitous drop of, of women after, after postdoc. So after postdoc, many women leave and do not apply to professorial professions, uh, pro uh, positions. And of course, they quota also do not address the issue that some topics are just not popular with women at the moment. So just to summarize, uh, just to say that AMBO actually does use quota in a few areas. So we do have a quota for our, uh, the composition for our committees. So there's always at least 30% women on all our committees. And uh, we have set the lower limit for me female speakers in our scientific conferences to 40%. Used to be 30% until last year, and we've now increased that to 40% because that seems to be a goal that is fairly easily reachable in the biological sciences today. Okay, thank you for your attention and happy to answer questions. Thanks so much, Gerland. Um, and actually, so uh, you had a little crash there, and so we lost your video at one point. I think if you maybe stop sharing the slides, we can get your video back. Um, well, there you are, in fact, great. Um, so I'm not have... sure I can, uh, uh, how I change my, stop yeah. my sharing. It's okay. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's uh, we'll take care of that. Um, in, for the moment, um, we do have a couple questions coming in. We have a few minutes for questions. <clears throat> so I have a question here from uh, Nadine Halberstadt. Uh, how does the cascade model work if the proportion of women is as low as 10%? It must take a century to get equality. That's right. That's uh, something that the uh, cascading model cannot address. So it does actually, it may lead into perpetuation of low numbers in such cases. Absolutely right. So, so there, what has to be done is, is, uh, is uh, um, you know doing something to increase the percentage of women applying for postdoc either for professorial positions or even to enter the subject? I think you might be talking about something like physics or so, right, where you really have low percentages of women even starting to study. So that is not addressed by the cascading model. Yeah, excellent. I have a, I have a something from the University of Amsterdam. Well, we had for certain things, we said set a minimum of 20% and the maximum of 70%, because in, in some of the arts uh, faculty, you have so many women that you can't do the percentages in that way. So there was a minimum and a maximum. Yes, that is true. And in the cascading model in North Rhine was failure, actually the, the, the maximum is 50%. So at 50%, they don't do anything anymore. And, um, and actually, I think there's a, a few other things that we can pick up in the longer discussion related to that. Um, I'll just um, end here for the moment on a comment, and Gerland, you may want to also um, answer back on this, um, that even without, sorry, this is from Colette Grillo, that even without quotas, some women think that they've got the job because they are women, and some men tell them that too. It's a cultural question. Um, I think also, and, and Gerland and I have several stories about this, that that we could um, tell about how that goes. But, uh, but uh, Gerland, if you have a quick comment on, on that or something we can bring into the longer discussion. Absolutely, and I think this is why the point of many women saying we don't want quota because we don't want to be the quota woman uh, is probably a moot point because uh, the suspicion is there anyway, whether you have quota or not. I've been told this many times by women who have been told that you're just a quota woman, even though there weren't quota in place. So absolutely right. Yeah. So that really gets at the way that uh, uh, that we advertise positions and the way that they're described, and we can talk about that in the discussion. So uh, Sylvia, is um, are you? Yes, you have your slides up. Excellent. So our last um, live talk for this session before we go to the discussion will be Sylvia Gonzalez Perez. And i um, very happy to be able to hear from you today, um, uh, particularly as you know, so we have sort of all the areas covered now. So Sylvia is um, an industrial chemical engineer at the Instituto Politecnico Nacional in Mexico. Uh, she has her doctorate in chemical sciences from the Autonomous University 
uh, Metropolitan in Mexico and a doctorate as well in theoretical and computational chemistry at the University of Barcelona in Spain. She also has done a lot of teaching and a lot of thinking about teaching, which is also very important in how we think about how uh, different people end up in positions and um, can move through the system. So she is a teacher, um, has taught in subjects related to physical chemistry and as well, importantly, on ethics at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels. Uh, she's been a visiting researcher at several universities, uh, both in Spain and in the U.S. And um, uh, importantly, and I wanted to emphasize that she received an award for early career women scientists in the developing world in chemistry um, from the Organization for Women Scientists in the Developing World and the Elsevier Foundation, and had received the Federico Gonzalez Suarez insignia which was for outstanding individuals in academia from the Quito city government. And I am, as a fan of city, um, uh, city uh, governance and power, I found that really interesting that, uh, that they uh, decided to have that award. So welcome, and uh, we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you to everybody for your interesting contributions, especially Natalie, Annalie, Sharon and all our organizers. It's a pleasure to be here and share the case of UTPL. I think it's an uh, inspiring, inspiring case for equality. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a teacher uh, and researcher in physical chemistry in this university in Ecuador. In Ecuador is marvelous. It's, it's, uh, uh, a precious, uh, uh, a nice country. Uh, it's very diverse, and we have forest, jungle, mountain. It's a high biodiversity. And Loja is in the sooner. And uh, this city have uh, three hundred thousand people. It's a small country for Latin America, for Latin America cities. Um, and in this city, uh, we are uh, as Loja has two universities, a national university or, and we. <laughs> um, this is a brief slide for show uh, our, our, our campus and um, I, I I want to talk about the um, the equality in for women and, and, and men in in our university the affirmative action uh, for favor women uh, indigenous people persons with different abilities was approved in 2014, but in case of women, uh, they are leaders before that, since its foundation in 1971. The UTPL had considered women are excellent professionals and they can make important apportation to the university. This is a, a phot photograph uh, about these years and in all uh, these are leaders in the university, and in all cases, we have an interesting woman presence. Uh, they are directors, head of departments, or vice counselors. This is photography, photographies. Uh, this is historical photographies, uh, in special in 1985, and in 1998, uh, uh, this uh, this woman, uh, Fanny Aguirre, she uh, she was the vice chancellor, and uh, in 1988, in in 1988, we are. We have our 
some directors or had uh, departments or vice chancellors, and always we have a presence uh, of women. They are actually, actually, this is our the two vice chancellors, uh, academics or researchers, and in all we have. Equality and in form, form it's it's a natural uh, work in in the university. Well, these are all photographs of the university life, and I want to talk, want to share our experience and a very, but I think the most important is why why we, uh, we have this normal equality in gender and in other, in other aspects. Yeah. I think it's because we have an, in, an institutional vision now and teach now. Our institutional vision is how he life, how he life, life in, in, in the century, in the first century of this area, or how he teach now in this, in this moment. He's proposed the freedom and he does not condemn don't discriminate. He relegated no one. He welcomed and include all. He promote unity and no division. He denounced injustice, indifference, and hypocrisy. Uh, in in UTPL, we have an anthropolog anthropological model, the vision of the being human. The human person is a spirit with a psychology and a body. He or she deserves to be educated along two lines. Education in ecstasy really is the law. And culture, I think we don't have traduction. I cannot translate it. It's Latin, it's Latin, Latin words. For say, uh, we have to care uh, and, and exquisite treatment to the person. The man is sacred to man. It's important. It's uh, God's son, and we have we need to treat in this with this quality. And in UTPL, we have something. We all have something to contribute, contribute, contribute to the university community. We, we are men, women, young people, adults, students, teachers, researchers, professors, administrative personnel, and academic personnel. The K is an, not or, or not versus, versus, because we need each other to bring out the best in each other, ourselves and others. Um, I think, oh, my impression, it's um, we can share the best of, of everybody and enjoy the meeting, enjoy uh, the class, enjoy the work time, the lab time, it's important for everybody. And I think it's uh, a case of equality, but I think we have to do, uh, we have to do more efforts to share this, uh, uh, our, our ideas, our uh, experience in, in, this, in this field. 
I don't know. I think it's my contribution. Great. Thank you so much, Sylvia. And um, this comes from from um, uh, uh, philosophies and models that that we don't sometimes think about in terms of how to build an institution. So um, again, as a reminder, if people have any questions, to put them in the chat. But I wanted to um, to ask you then what is your so if we are building institutions to start and we wanted to look at UTPL as as a model, did that equality come from, was, was it there instantly because it would be in essence demanded by the humanism of Christ that you spoke of? Or was it something that really sort of needed to be worked on? So in the earlier talks also we hear about you know, once you have a, a role gendered, it is very hard to get away from that. Would there have to be sort of a discussion saying we are going to make a point not to gender these or it just sort of happens? What is your sense of that from your knowledge of the history of the Institute? No, uh, yes, this, um, I think the progress in this in this field, is seen as is it, it, it is seen as uh, for uh, for work for equality. Um, I think equality is a consequence of a life or the decisions of, of of important decisions, essential decisions, and this essential decision is was in, in the moment was uh, declared and work to institutional uh, for have uh, for for have an institutional view we need to know how where we want to go so uh, where uh, we need the kingdom uh, God's kingdom in in the culture and the knowledge. So how do it? Well, we work with the people, or all, all, all people in in the university, in all personnel are important. So we work to work in the merits, in the in the laws, in the in the rules. All is important, but all, but all have to fund it in this principle. All people are important. The law is um, uh, uh, um, uh, the law is the basis, uh, the fundament of the relationships, the personal relationships, and all people is important and we have to trade in this in this way. Not all people <laughs> work in this sense, but if you choose the key persons and you can uh, give the instruments, the um, all necessary to work in this in in this in this sense the rest people uh, you you can inspire inspire uh, other peoples that that probably don't share this this vision but if they are with people and they see they are happy they are uh, with pace, <laughs> uh, they are are with enthusiasm. It's it's more easy, and we know we are working. We we don't we, we don't um, we don't have we, we, we don't we are in winners. <laughs> we are working to uh, transmit it, uh, uh, speak, teach inspiring uh, all community 
I think in in five in, in fifty years we are we, we work in this sense and we have uh, we have a lot of work, but I think is um, uh, we are on the way. Yeah. No, that's great because it it sounds like you got actually exactly at what I I was wondering about was because it it sounds like a very positive and aspirational model from the start, um, rather than having to to take the the sort of the negative view, and so it builds out from there. So I think we can all really learn quite a bit from that, and it'll definitely be interesting to to see what is um, what will happen next and if that model can be um, spread further. So this is really great. And actually, if um, I could ask your indulgence then to um, to continue with questions for you, but to move into the general discussion now. So again, to the um, to all the participants, uh, if you have any questions or comments to go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, I want to open, um, and actually, and Lise, uh, feel free to jump in as well in your moderator role, although right now I have a, a question here from Annelise that I will um, propose and start with you, Sylvia, and I will work up my list as I see it. Um, so the initial question is, what are the most effective actions to get quotas accepted? And I'll, I'll go ahead and start with Sylvia, and then we will take the rest of the group. Uh, if you would like, you're not required to, but uh, Sylvia, if you want to start, feel free to take that. I, I, did you answer me? Yeah, so if, okay, so the general question to, to everybody right now, just an open session. Very what, are you, what are the most effective actions to get quotas accepted? I don't know if I'm, I'm can you hear me okay, Sophie? I think there's so what's the major question woman in the case of the uh, There's a little this problem. Yeah, there's a little problem with your audio. So can you hold on a sec so we can fix this? Um, okay, so let me go to, to Rene for the moment and I'll come back to you. Um, is uh, what are the most effective actions to get quota accepted? Uh, maybe maybe we can uh, mute Sylvia because there is a, a, a Natalie. Could you mute Sylvia? Is is Natalie? Uh, oh, it's not a problem coming from Sylvia. It's a problem coming from somewhere else. Yeah. We don't hear anything at the moment. I, I don't hear any bad sound. Okay, so, all right. Okay, so let's try again if everybody is hearing okay now. Okay, so I want to open with a general question to all of you, um, which is what are the most effective actions to get quotas accepted? So let's start, we'll go up, up the list. So uh, Garland, and then Rene, and then Sylvia, and we will get the mics fixed. So, Gelland, you're muted now. Now, okay. Given, given, ah, now you hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. Given what, what we have said before, that um, there's also women who are against quota. They don't like to be seen as quota token, token quota women. Um, I think the best way is uh, to do it by law. To just make a law that this is what we have. So there's no choice. There's no discussions. Really, I mean. So I like the way Northland Westphalia has done it. It's the law, so there's no one who can, no one can get around it. I like the way uh, Norway has done it. It's the law. You have to have forty percent of women on boards. Period. No discussions further. So I think that is the most effective way because if you are trying to convince everybody, I'm sure you would take as long as you will have the quota, <laughs> as you will have to have the quota in place to reach quality, as we've seen earlier. Thanks. If I, if I may add something, I think that you also need accountability with the with the legal applica uh, the legal um, obligations because yes. 
And then I think also because of still some having to have this uh, like backlash against it, we have had a, a, a certain period in the University of Amsterdam when we had quota and we had all kinds of uh, remarks and we were got a training to make sort of one sentence answers. And one of the ones for saying from, isn't it bad for you to be to be selected because you are a woman? And the answer is, it's much worse not to be selected because you are a woman. Poor, period. <laughs> and at least the video is off, is that on purpose? Yes. Yeah, and also Sylvia, are you still with us? I don't know where Sylvia went now. <laughs> so, sorry. Um, while we're waiting to find Sylvia, um, Rene, what is your thought on the most effective uh, sci uh, action to get quota accepted? Um, that's actually a difficult question. I mean, I tend to think that, yes, uh, a mandate will be the most effective, obviously. Yes, that uh, uh, it's either in law or it's a sort of a quote unquote uh, sort of something that everybody agrees on. It may not be strictly, man, you know, inscribed in law, but uh, it's understood that, uh, you know, uh, we need equal representation of all kinds and all cultures. That's why I, I kind of liked Maggie's uh, uh, talk where she, you know, talked about inclusive, inclusiveness of, you know, different cultures, different types of, of whether you have disabilities, etc. Because it's all looking at the other as being different and then you know uh not really wanting so you get cliquish uh kind of uh, uh ensemblers and then uh you quickly become the other and i think that really needs to be to be worked on and it's a social problem of course um but can i just take uh a little different tack and maybe um, if you permit me just to to add a little different angle to this is is that okay if i were to do that right now yeah sure in a minute because there's some questions coming in so i want to make sure to get to them but go ahead yeah yeah, sure. yeah. so i also wanted to make a pitch for uh, i know that this is a societal issue but i think women also need to uh, grow in self-esteem and I often find that uh, many women that one interacts with at various levels uh, seem to have this burden maybe coming from society or wherever where they do lack in in self-esteem and if there is some way to um, you know because the stem is not really different from society it's it's part of society so i think that there is a much broader problem over here and therefore perhaps uh the social the mandates might be you know the way to go yeah i that's all i'd like to say Yeah, so and um, and in fact, so on, so that's actually useful framing for a couple of comments and questions that have come in as well. So I want to just point these out um, and we can take them together. Um, one from Laurent Balton. Um, it means that the choice of STEM studies is probably primarily driven by non cultural cues, more likely driven by biological cues linked to sex. So quotas may be forcing women into fields they have deserted in consequence of more gender equal policies. So if anyone wants to comment on that, um, and as well, the observation from uh, Lucia Anos that the university in Brazil has been around for 112 years and have had one um, female president out of 28 total. And if there's any comparisons in other countries which also gets at the standard role. Um, 
I, I was really struck by Sylvia's uh, example of UTPL because I think we all know that there are many, many, many religious universities in Christ, the Redeemer, Christ the Equalizer, etc. But I can honestly say you know, come from, let's say, from a country like India, which has had a long history of uh, Catholicism and Protestantism. Uh, I don't see any example of this kind of equality in any of the religious uh, Christian institutions that I uh, have encountered. So I, I think that the UTPL example is quite unique and therefore uh, the comments that came from Brazil that there was you know, only, uh, uh, there weren't any women in the higher echelons. Uh, I think that's pretty much true for all Christian universities. Absolutely. Christianism is not known for equality at all. <laughs> yes, I didn't want to get into that, but I, yeah. And, sorry, I have a question to Laurent Valton's question. I don't understand it, honestly. So maybe forcing women into fields they have deserted in consequence of more gender equal policies? But what is meant by that? Do you understand, Michelle? I did when I read it initially, but now I'd, be, I'd have to reconstruct it. Laura, if you're still there, if you can put a little more detail on that. But I, I took it to mean that... Um... Michelle, you're gone? Michelle, we lost you. Okay, I will take, I will take it over. If she's gone. Yeah, it's uh Michelle, you were gone. Yes, I know. Yes, I am back now, but uh it's uh has Anne Lee solved the uh Laurent question problem? <laughs> no, we haven't heard from Laurent. Oh, okay. So but you you were just about to say something, so I'll let you take it for the moment here. Okay. Well, do we have any more questions about I don't see anything. Um, I'm trying to, I'm scrolling through the back, through the backs. It's, yeah, a lot of them are related to that issue about um, career selection and um, the self-esteem issue and sociocultural yeah. works. And so actually what that, that sort of is tangential to, at least for me also, is that, so there's the internal bias against ourselves by not having self-esteem, not thinking we can do it, but then also the external biases and we didn't really, that, that was not the point of today's discussion per se, but there's a little bit of a overlap there. So um, particularly if anyone could address that intersection between external biases and perhaps use of quotas to, if not solve it, then mitigate it. Uh, we're happy to hear from you on that. Well, I think quotas are there to, to overcome biases, right? So you can basically um, relate the, the death of women in science and higher echelons of academia to, you know, the self-discrimination uh, or self, you know, biases, as Renee was uh, already uh, mentioning. And then, of course, the biases from the outside. If you, uh, if people, you know, in academia, mostly men think about highly qualified uh, scientists. They see the male example, and that's basically what they define as as a successful scientist. And that's basically their biases, not being able to see the things that are going to the right and the left of that uh, particular example. So um, biases are clearly at the heart of what we want to address with quota. And biases are very difficult to address, you know, because they have been growing in the culture, they are part of the way you grew up. It is, it has been shown that even if you do bias training to committees, to with individuals, it is not something that lasts very long. So it seems to me that uh, quota are the most efficient way of addressing these biases. 
I so, think also that we need we need we need the to to help women to just do things and and you have to need support systems to to just encourage them to to go and and, and apply for for positions and that that's also quite effective i think but i think i saw a finger from renee yeah i think renee yeah um <clears throat> i just wanted to to bring up something else in which might uh, i don't know help us to think this through um how many of us would feel for example that uh, if we wanted you know uh, the best medical treatment uh, would we be biased towards a female uh, doctor a male doctor or do and I, I mean i have some background of of medicine and i was i get the feeling but i could be completely wrong that um, in the medical areas, in, especially in, in um, you know, diagnostics, etc., uh, it doesn't really matter, you know, whether people will approach the most qualified person, whether it's male or female. So does it, or, or I see Annalise shaking her head and saying no, uh, but I was wondering if it is in other areas like research, etc., where it's not really a matter of life and death, you know, whether you go to the best doctor or not, and it doesn't matter whether it's male or female. Um, is there a difference there that one perceives, or am I just thinking, in, 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 you know, have a wrong perception? Well, I must say that because the perception is that males are that that, fem that females are less qualified than males that's a perception which is quite often the case in society then people would have a preference for a male doctor because they have the, the idea that they are better which is not true at all if you have 20 percent female doctors and 80 percent male then the 20 percent females are probably on on the average better than the, than the, if you do choose someone because if you choose someone from the males, you have about 30%, which is not as good as, as the women. If you if you take a 50-50% idea about, about qualifications and, and abilities. So so you see it's 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 all a matter of, of perceptions in that way. And that's and I think that's throughout society, because we are so used to getting to seeing white male, especially white males in all kinds of prominent positions, that they that you get the sort of automatic feeling that they are the best. And so that's one of the, the things you should, I got a, a, a question about the detail, the kinds of measurements that should accompany quotas, because you can have the legal actions. Okay, so it has to be. But also these legal actions are not always taken into account. I mean, it goes very, very slowly and they try on all kinds of ways not to do it. And there should be accountability in also with those measures. There should be accountabilities, but there also should be, uh, uh, you should still work frappe to you about the uh, perceptions of people about the qualities of men and women. And so it's also it's also a, the perception that, that, that women are better in, in taking care of you, which is also making life difficult for a lot of people because they feel it in themselves. They should take care of the children, not to take it or leave it to the men, which is really difficult in then you want a career and you have to because you have to share the responsibility and the time. So these are all kinds of things you should do together with imposing quota to make it accepted, accepted by society. Because legal, a legal mandate is not enough to get it. Yeah, I think Gerlin, you may have a comment on that as well because I know you've done some work on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. We do need, as, I mean, basically, we were just you said it in just different ways. We do need a, we do need a societal revolution, right? In in our ways, how we educate our children to think about uh, what makes a man, what makes a woman, what is typical for either, and you know, we just need to change that if we really wanted to change, uh, um, you know, equal, equal, you know, equal, and give equal op opportunity. Um, on the other hand, I think quota are a way to bootstrap. Basically, you sort of create a situation where where 
where you have equal representation um, and and this is what is being seen and the generation growing up sees that as the natural so it's really a way to to uh, force things uh, in a yeah to get things done um, before waiting for society to change in I don't know 100 years or how many how much time will society uh, need to change right so it's taken 100 years for us to get this far right the first women entering universities in any kinds of numbers were at the beginning of the of the 20th century right so at uh, 100 years later we are at you know, on average, full professorial level at 20 something percent, at least in Europe, and certainly similar in other countries as we've seen in other countries and continents. Um, right? Are we going to wait another 100 years? That's, I think, the question. Do we want our doctors to wait another 100 years? Yeah, this, this, this is a question of a comment by Selma Nesdagui. She said, uh, Women are, they are. Hard working and patient, but I'm not as patient to to, to wait for 50 years, 100 years to get this kind of equality. Yeah. And I don't want this for my daughters and client daughters, granddaughters, and so on. Uh, this why also the, the this quota data that I showed, you know, these this, um, uh, extrapolations are also quite frustrating, right? So it's not that we have quota in place uh, for 10 years and then everything will be fine. It may not be that, right? Well, and so actually, I would want to just picking up from a few of the comments and questions here. So there's sort of um, several sort of pointing toward some disconnect between um, what, you know, if we really want to talk about making these things regulatory or legal, how do we deal with the disconnect between that and um, and the institutes themselves, which may not have the capacity to do it or may not have the willingness to do it. And again, we sort of alluded to this earlier with Rene's talk about, you know, how much you can actually, um, you know, it's push versus pull, right? Do we want to just try to somehow get the institutes on board for this or do we need a law? So there's that general, I'm just throwing these out just because we're running out of time. So I just want to make sure to get um, all the questions or comments in. Um, a uh, comment from uh, Claire Trevinkenberg, uh, injunctive gender norms are easy to internalize and difficult to deviate from. So this is, for example, the research on fathers taking paternity leave, which is also something we've discussed at some length. Um, so if anyone sort of has any uh, uh, comment on that, and again, particularly if we take, so I, I was interested to hear the very clear answer about you know, quota fixes bias. I mean, you didn't say it exactly that way, but it's very clear. There's no, um, you know, no real ambiguity there. So if that's the case, then what else do we have to worry about is sort of what I'm getting at with these. Rene. Uh, I'm happy that uh, the issue of paternity leave has come up because I can say that particularly in India, uh, Although it's the paternity leave is nowhere like it is in the Nordic countries, for example, where I think, you know, it's quite extensive, but even the fact that paternity leave is possible, I think, uh, has, uh, opened up, you know, young fathers and young men's minds to the fact that they do have a role to play in, in this whole business of nurturing and you know, family life in terms of uh, actually caring for, uh, you know, young children. And so I think that in that case, or particularly, uh, it has brought in quite a bit of exposure to the fact that, uh, yes, this is important. And yes, you should do it. Not that you are entitled to, you know, take leave and then sit around doing nothing, but it's really meant for you to to participate in the process. So I think that that has been a marvelous, uh, you know, uh, sort of mandate. That's very, very good. And then, so if no further comment on that, then there was uh, sort of a um, 
I can't quite find it now, but the issue about the the strong use of quotas, particularly in um, uh, here it is. Uh, the Nordic countries have uh, fewer women in the STEM fields by a substantial margin, even though they have the strong use of quotas. So again, clearly there's some disconnect there if anyone wishes to uh, comment on that, um, both the, uh, the causes and whether there is a fix for that. I'm not sure that this is true. Say more. So um, it, it really also, I'm, so as I said, I'm not sure that, that this is too, true, um, but um, it also, you know, one thing, of course, so if you look at inequalities between different uh, countries, you know, where, uh, why are more women in some countries uh, versus uh, other countries? For example, if you look in Europe, if you look into, uh, Portugal and Turkey have traditionally quite a large number of women in, in uh, professorial positions. It also has to do with the prestige that the, that the uh, profession has, right? And the, the way you can, you know, and the money you can earn. In Turkey, you want to become an engineer, not a scientist, as a life scientist or whatever scientist, you don't earn very much, right? So, and the prestige is, uh, is, is correspondingly low. That's why these positions are left to women, right? And they could enter at some stage. That is different in Scandinavia, for example, where this is very prestigious. So it also has to do with, 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 with that. Um, right, in terms of, as I said, I do not know whether the data that you're saying is actually true. There are certainly sciences that are more attractive to women or that attract more women than, um, than like biology, for example, than physics would, for example. Um, the question is why that is. And uh, I think we would have to go to very early uh, uh, childhood to see when these um, roots are actually being set, right? So as a child, you already learn that um, you're the guys are much better calculating things than the girls, and you are know, not very uh, female or male if you are if you can't do either of these things very well. So basically, you already see yourself as as um, as uh, as a woman. You would already see yourself as somebody who's not good in mathematics. Hence, you would have a much uh, higher energy act <laughs> activation barrier to go into these um, into these uh, areas. So I think that is very difficult to disentangle. Um, and we do not have the options of doing the real experiment to see, you know, if the way I doubt it. And I also don't think if you know, uh, if you look at general characteristics that women are that much more empathic and that's why they would go into you know, certain uh, areas much more than, than men. Um, the research actually does not bear that out. So I think it is a societal thing. Yeah, and there's a comment here also from Rachel Ivey, um, uh, agreeing with Kletch's earlier comment that injunctive norms are installed very early in children. So, which goes along with another sort of observation here that that when we're thinking about the, the cultural issues that get here, it, it's not just sort of the interior culture and the legal culture, but there's all of these other things that we have to work on there. So um, it's, uh, it, it's just super, super complex. And again, the getting at quota, there was an earlier comment that I can't quite find now, but it was basically like, you know, bottom line, try quotas. And maybe that is what comes from there. Um, and Lise, were you wanting to get- Well, in? I think that it's time for it's, a wrap up. Yeah, actually. we're very close. Yeah, but if, if you, if I just wanted to check, yeah, I think we're pretty much yeah. there. So, yeah, so actually, and uh, if, I, if I could just start that by saying, just I, really, I, I will have no comment or concluding remarks other than to say that, that it was, I really actually wanted to thank the, the standing committee for including me in this, um, in this webinar. It was really, um, it was a great group of people that we worked with and it was super interesting even, you know, just for this short amount of time and um, we're really sorry that somehow we've lost Sylvia entirely. So we will um, try to communicate to her what went on in the last 20 minutes so she's caught up. 
as well and see if she has any further comments to add. But I just really wanted to, to thank everyone for their intention and the really good uh, questions and comments here. And with that, I would turn to and Lise for, um, for real concluding remarks and to take us out. Okay, I would, uh, I would like to begin to, to thank the technicians because this was really flawless compared to some of the other things I've seen. So to get the videos in so in time, really great. Thank you very much and everyone with the organization. I would like to um, add, have some comments on, on Maggie's talk because she can't do it herself. So what I gathered from her talk that I have um, that 1.1 legal actions are really important and necessary, but again, accountability is also uh, even maybe more important to do that. Otherwise, then people get around it. The second thing I came out was that it's very important to have a really quota in funding because that's where also one of the bottlenecks is for, for women scientists. And the third thing is that you have to tune to different cultures and regional approaches because not everyone is the same. We're all equal, but not we're not all the same. And so that's one of the things. And then the other thing is that you have to really look into safe and equal spaces for people to, to be able to work and also to get societal um, acceptance of quota, because if it's just imposed by law and not accepted in society it's really difficult and one and one of the things again um when people watch what they have measures needs necessary is having support systems to to help uh, people who want to uh, to acquire equal equability and it's also very beneficial for society to have more diversity in all kinds of um what do you call that, uh, decision-making bodies, because it will be, they really work better. That has been sought out by, by scientific research. So we will have to do, and I will say that I would like to have this all in, in a kind of a report so that we can send it along and uh, let other people uh, benefit from what we did today. So thanks to everyone, and I would like to see what the other speakers have taken from this uh, comment, have comments on this. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, listening to different perspectives and I learned a lot. Uh, I would really, I think, like to end by uh, in my person, I'm speaking really personally here. I think that uh, women, and I want to bring in this self-esteem issue uh, and center, because even though you may have quotas and et cetera, et cetera, and those are important and necessary, I, I think that women need to feel comfortable in the presence of men without being intimidated or you know without feeling that they are not equal because of their indoctrination through society and i think that if women can achieve this uh, for themselves uh, then you know it will be easier for them to uh, not be um, uh, a sinecure of, you know, oh, you got in because you're a woman kind of thing. Women have to be confident. They have to have self-esteem. And then I think many things will become easier. So that's my general uh, personal view. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think we are off anyway, so I'm not sure. I like to thank everybody for their contributions. It was interesting. Too bad that Maggie couldn't be here. That would have been also very interesting to hear from her experience in uh, in Australia. Ah, okay. Sorry, I was reading that no not yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank you. I have one comment. I I, I saw again about uh, quota for bricklayers and plumbers, but um, there are also very large programs to try and get women into these professions huh? yeah because i think that's very that's, that's just the other end of society that is just as yeah. important right yes. yeah 
and that's a larger part of society than, than what we are looking at, right? For sure. Well, thank you, everyone. I think Michelle, thank you for helping me for doing this, and 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 Natalie for taking getting us all in to do these kind of things. Oh, and I have to have an announcement that we have the yeah, the next one will be. Oh, where is my paper? The next one will be in October by um, the Chemical Society. Then the next webinar, and I, I lost my paper where I put it all on. So, but the announcement is that we have the, uh, the next one for the, uh, I'm trying to find my paper. I have a very small computer and a very small screen, which is really difficult. So see what we have. Um, come on. In the meantime, should I, I mean, one thing that I would like oh, to the say. Next, the, next webinar. the next webinar will be in October, this October, and organized by International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. So I think this is the end of the webinar. Okay, thank you very much.